It's Friday, and I'm back with the next in the Fanzine Friday series. Today we take a look at Demon's Blood, number two, from 1979. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today, that's Demon's Blood number two. Hope you enjoy today's video. Okay, so we are back again today, taking a look at this fanzine called Demon's Blood, which starts in 1979 and comes to us from the United Kingdom. Brian Dalton is the editor responsible for this. Uh, this one is the size we're used to. It's heavy stock cover, uh, pages folded in half with, with staples. The artwork to start here with the cover, this is Paul Blackwell. He does most of the illustrations in, in this issue. Uh, this cover art piece is, it says at the bottom, it has the word drow. So that tells us that's what he was intending this to be. He does have the hand crossbow and the short sword here uh, for, his, for his character he's drawn. There is a table of contents. I've retyped it for you. Um, go over that high level. Bestial Growls is sort of the editor's editorial. I should say page two has just information about submissions and subscriptions. Um, Heliosian Tales are, is um, commentary on some tips for running your D&D game. We mentioned last time, this fanzine is sort of a combination of an APA where outside parties are typing up two three four pages of their sort of like mini fanzine they send those in and they get collated so he has several of those as well as some sort of um sort of standalone type articles we might have seen in something like the dungeoneer underworld oracle or others that we've looked at so earth and fire wind and water is a outside party fan sort of mini fanzine werewolf commons is as well that that's the one that belongs to, to the editor brian dalton uh, the review section is a review of a new game called Spellmaker, which he liked a lot, said it's not particularly serious, so if you're into that kind of game, you might not like it because it's a little too silly, but he thought it was a lot of fun. And essentially, it's a fantasy-based game. There's a princess captured by a dragon. Your g goal in the game is to get your um, your character over to the princess, rescue her, and get her back without you know being dispatched by the uh, various creatures that will try to stop you. The Pot Boils Over, another small fanzine. Uh, the Mind Maze is a um, small adventure. Oddities 2 is a, another fanzine. Grim News is another fanzine. Things That Go Bump in the Night are the new monsters. Uh, Grillox, another fanzine. And the character file at the back is a um, list of pre-rolled NPCs. So it gives you some stats and like two or three sentences about like their background or their motivation or something like that. And then we've got the contributors here. Uh, I mentioned Brian Dalton. Paul Blackwell does most of the art. Uh, he says Simon Burley does a little bit and Brian Dalton, the uh, editor, also does a little bit of art. And then the rest of the contributors listed here uh, provided the many fanzines uh, with the exception of Dave Flynn whose contribution is one of the new monsters that's in the things that go bump in the night section. So Heliosian Tales is some tips on running things in your campaign, your D&D campaign. Today's topic is paralysis, and he's taking on the question of uh, the unanswered question in the Monster Manual and elsewhere about what happens when it says a creature like a ghoul or carrion crawler will paralyze you if it has a successful hit. It doesn't tell you how long that lasts. He says really you have three choices, right? One is permanent, uh, two is a number of rounds, and three is essentially making it something that there's some type of spell, clerical spell, for example, that would cure it. Maybe it's a curse, um, maybe it's a bless, who knows, right? That's, that'd be up for the DM to decide. And of course, as he says, permanent doesn't feel right because then these would become some of the most fearsome monsters in the entire monster manual, even though they're fairly low hit dice. And so he lands on the idea, as I do, that it should be for a number of rounds. And so he's got a suggestion on how to do that. Uh, his suggestion is you roll 3d6, you add the number of hit dice of the monster, and you subtract the constitution of the character who's failed his saving, his or her saving throw. And if that gives you a zero or less, then you're slowed. You move at half 
speed, attack at half speed um, for some number of rounds, usually until the end of combat. And of course he says, don't forget, if you get hit once, twice, those effects can compound on each other as well. So I thought that was a pretty, I thought that was a pretty well thought out article. I like it quite a bit. The other thing he talks about were some concepts around magic. He's trying to bring in a little bit of the science about, uh, you know, there can't be any, any sort of release of energy without a sort of corresponding negative to that energy, right? Sort of keeping things in balance. And he says he likes to apply that to magical items. So, for example, a ring of fire resistance um, makes you actually warmer at some level, even if it's magical. And so, therefore, you should take increased damage from cold. He said if you get a sword that has a plus against a particular type of monster, um, figure out a way to make you use that. Maybe like if it's a trolls or dragons, like you've got to uh, actually attack that type of creature every so often or you lose the enchantment. I might actually say lose all the enchantment of the sword. Something like that to give it a counterbalance. Um, potion of heroism. He says yeah, you get the bonuses, but you're also like forced to be heroic, right? So you're going to be super bold and charge into combat even if it's not a great idea. Gauntlets of Ogre power. He says if you're going to get the bonuses of being an ogre, you should get the penalties. So your strength may go up, but your intelligence should go down. And then um, the last thing he talks about are wands. And he says, you know, if you're going to release some type of energy, you probably would take some damage yourself. If you try to insulate yourself, he said his response is without the physical connection, um, the insulation in effect keeps you from being able to activate the wand. So no way to try and get, you know, sort of smartly get, your, get yourself around that penalty. So anyways, interesting ideas. I like some balancing concepts are always a lot of fun. Now we've got a fanzine essentially here from Paul Blackwell called Earth and Fire, Wind and Water. And this is all about the items that an NPC type character might have. And so he's got all these charts um, based on the class of the NPC and the race and you roll it decides to give you enchanted armor, weapons, etc. And then he's got other charts once you decide what type of enchanted things the character is going to have. You know, the more charts to roll to see exactly what type of armor, what type of potions, etc. someone might have. Which are all, you know, it's all pretty well done. Um, a few things in here that essentially I think seem to me at least to be new magical items that I'll, I'll mention. He has a thing called a Staff of Brightness that's a light spell. Sort of like Gandalf's staff, right? It'll last for a long time. A Staff of Arrows, which will shoot magic missiles. Staff of the Spider, which will shoot a web spell. Uh, Staff of the Four Winds, which creates a vortex that essentially acts as a protection from missiles spell. Uh, a quest staff, which is cursed and gives you a quest when you pick it up. And a Staff of Undead Turning, which turns us an 8th level cleric. And a Staff of Goodness, which rem essentially removes curses. And he also has something he calls a Crystal Sword, which is he says a plus 5 sword. That's probably a little too high. Um, but the counterbalance to that is anytime you miss, uh, he says there's a chance that the sword actually um, fractures and, and is just permanently destroyed. So uh, some good ideas there, I thought, uh, on that. He also had some silly items I'm not going to get into. Um, but uh, there's, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a fun article. It's very nicely focused, I thought. Uh, Paul did a good job. Uh, then we get into Werewolf Comments 2, which is last issue was number one. That's kind of how they did these APAs. They would tend to, some people would tend to number each month. You know, this is my third issue, fourth issue, even though in the overall design it might have been um, a different, you know, they might be ahead, ahead of you if you don't contribute from the very beginning. So in this fanzine, uh, Brian Dalton is continuing to discuss his world, which is called uh, Lim Am Esh. And he's, he said last time he sort of went into the deities and how that worked. Uh, this time he's given a little more uh, practical uh, information. And he talks about how there's a high king um, who is a druid chosen from a group of druids, you know, from among the members. They elect someone to be the high king until that guy dies. They elect a new one. And then the kingdoms around there all have kings who are appointed by the high king. And each of, each of the druids is assigned to one of those kings as sort of a, a personal advisor. And that's how they're kingdom is structured. And so here's a map of, of this area of his home campaign and a, a bunch of additional uh, details about that. You know, Wandering Monsters, uh, some ideas about the terrain in the map and, and so forth. And it's, it's, it's good, and I think someone else said this. Early on, I think even today, it's interesting to read about other people's campaigns to get a flavor for their ideas, uh, to get an idea of how they're running 
their particular campaign when they've got a homemade campaign like this. So the pot boils over, and that's an article um, a fanzine that comes to us from David Cooper. He's this first time contributor to this fanzine. Gives a little background about himself, and then he talks about um, TSR modules. He likes them quite a bit, and he wants to talk a little bit about the, the party that went through the Tomb of Horrors. And um, it, no surprise, talks about some of the various traps and challenges they overcame, and Sphere of Annihilation, the whole party died. Uh, but he said it was a lot of fun, and he appreciated Gygax's um, Killer Dungeon. Uh, the other thing that he talks about uh, in, in his fanzine are a couple of uh, ideas for magic items. Um, he's got the Sword of Solitude, which gives you bonuses only if the character is completely by him or herself. He says, not 20 feet ahead, I mean like you completely go off on your own, sort of almost like a solo adventure scenario, then it gives you some pluses. Don't love that because I don't love that concept, unless you know you had somebody in your campaign you ended up doing solo adventures a lot, maybe that'd be okay. And then he's got this, I think, kind of cool idea for cursed armor, which is, it's double cursed. And so you get a curse, typical curse, whatever it is, um, but then when you remove it, a second curse kicks in. And the only way to stop that curse is to put the cursed armor back on, which will cancel the second curse and put you back into the first curse. And of course you can remove curse twice, and I don't know why you wouldn't do that, uh, and just get rid of it all together. Um, and he talks about some other games that he's played, uh, which I wasn't particularly familiar with. And then, like people do a lot of times in these APA type fanzine scenarios, he talks about, he gives some comments on the stuff from the first um, episode. And I find that to be a particularly interesting way. If you can get several of these fan, APA type fanzines in a row, it's interesting to read people's the comments. And you can get these really complex back and forth things that go on for episode after episode, uh, issue after, after issue people talking back and forth to each other well that's not what I wrote, you know that's not what I meant or here's what I think oh I like your idea you know and it's it's really good to see the community that gets built uh, through these fanzines uh, these APA type fanzines and, he, and we got to start to that he's he liked some of the articles he didn't like some of the other ones so that's all pretty pretty good stuff the next one we have here is the mind maze and that comes to us from Colin Ing Ingham um, who's an, again a first-time contributor he says, at the thriving port of Hasfan, there's a mysterious edifice in black obsidian with strange and undeciphered ruins on the side, 100 feet tall. Uh, no sign of entrance and shunned by everyone. Insides are supposed to have been shaped by the dreams and wishes of man. Its passages carved by desire. But as mana is failing, dreams become petty and probably so have the perils of this artifact of lost time. And so that's sort of the uh, very colorful intro. And, and off you go into the uh, into the mind maze, and here are his maps. I like this one. I thought it was I thought it was kind of a fun uh, ad adventure. Probably just one session, unless your characters just get completely bogged down. Um, but this could be again, this could be a lot of fun to play through. So here's Oddities Two by Stephen Barber. This is his uh, second contribution. He was in the original Demon's Blood number one as well. First, he has a couple reviews from Metagames a Black Hole and Warp War. He likes both of those. Uh, he talks a little bit about then Dungeons and Dragons. One of the things he wants to talk about are um, his rolls. If you get a natural one, he makes you roll to see if you break your weapon. So no bonuses, 75% chance it's going to break, and then plus um, reduces the chance. But even at a plus five, you still have a 3% chance that your weapon will break, I think. Uh, the breaking magic weapons on a on a one I probably wouldn't do, but anyway, I get the point. It's fairly common. As he says, the only thing you don't have to roll for for breaking is if you had an artifact, which I don't know. Most of my campaigns, people never end up with artifacts. It's a little overpowered. He asks if anyone has any tables they've worked up for vampires as player characters. Uh, that seems like a horrible idea to me. Um, and then he, he talks quite a bit about some ideas around concealed secret doors, which I think is probably a topic that deserves some, some attention. I, I don't think the original idea with the secret and concealed doors works great. It's a, you know, a human has a 16% chance to find one and, you know, while they're searching, they got to pick the right wall to search on, you're rolling wandering, wandering monster tables. It, it's, it seems like, as much as we all like to use them, that the chance of finding them is, is not all that great. He has his own system. He says you create a difficulty, sort of a concealment number for it, 
and then he gives you bonuses for um, racial bonuses for elves and dwarves of plus four, plus two, respectively. He gives you um, intelligence and wisdom, uh, and then you roll a d6. And if you your number exceeds the concealment rating, then you realize there's something going on there. Uh, and if it's under, then then you don't. But it, it seems to give a I think the way he's got it structured, the idea is it's going to, if you're actively searching, you're going to take the time to do that. It's a much higher chance you'll actually find find what's there. Um, because we've all probably had the occasion, if you're really using the dice, a party of five or six people could search a room with a secret door and, you know, find nothing. The other thing he says is he likes to use uh, secret doors as a passage to either like greater treasure or, and or greater da danger, maybe both. Uh, and he likes to have you find something that maybe it's a key or some object that will sort of draw you back or help you open, find and or open that door so that you know there's a door to go look for, that kind of thing. Um, and then he also talks about what he says is sort of how you guide the, the, you can guide the party without actually forcing them to do something, right? So he's like, if I paint a floor green, they think it's slime, they'll never go in. You know, I'll put a pentagram on the floor my party inevitably turns away from that every time. The other thing, he, and, and so the other thing he talks about, which I thought was interesting conversation, is, is wandering monsters and how he handles it. Uh, and he said, you know, he, he creates certain types of monsters are attracted to combat and death, and so whenever you're engaged in combat, there's a higher probability that certain types of monsters are going to be drawn to that. And of course, there you have a monster who almost inevitably has no treasure, so what's the, in some respects, what's the benefit? Um, and it can also be a way, also be used as a way to guide the party because they'll run away from, you know, this new, they just finished a combat, new monster shows up, kind of tough, no treasure, party may tend to run away from that, at least in his campaign. The other thing he said he likes to do is uh, adjust his experience points to encourage certain behaviors. And so he says he triples X XP for melee combat victory. Um, doubles it for magic combat victory and um, single XP rating for success without combat. So parlay, otherwise, you, you know, convincing them to, to, to not have to be, uh, to not have to have combat. And then he halves the experience you get for magic and gold in order to make the, make a successful combat more valuable than, you know, necessarily the riches you might, you might get from it. He, he says one of the things this does is give a little bit more incentive to fighter type characters who obviously take a lot of the risk usually in a party but don't get nearly as much reward um, uh, potentially. He also talked about um, bonuses or penalties um, based on characteristics and so he says he has a table. He says you can, he has this table and you can roll, it might give you a bonus and, and I think in the first I think it was the first issue of, of this fanzine that had um, some bonuses you could get, you know, to various characteristics or skills, like maybe your plus one with swords or something like that. So he's got a table like that, um, but like this idea of balance, whenever you get that, you're going to take a penalty, some some negative aspect to your character, right? Uh, and so, and then he'll give you some experience bonus if you play consistent with your, your characteristics and your... Uh, Sort of your bonuses and your limitations. Okay, so here's Grim News. This is uh, volume one. I don't think I have this person's name at the beginning. So this comes to us from David Waring, who says he is a regular contributor to Troll Crusher, uh, where he has a fanzine he calls Creeping Waffle. And so, but here he's going to distinguish it by calling what appears here in Demon's Blood is Grim News. Uh, this guy's clearly a, a good. Um, Contributor, his article is very well thought out. Talks a little bit about uh, On Guard that he plays. And um, secondly, he wants to encourage people to go to something called Gordiacon, G E O R D I E C O N, Gordiacon. So he's not affiliated with it. He thinks people should go. Makes an excellent point, which is you know, what, one of the great things about going to a uh, convention is meeting other players that you don't know. He says you learn so much from being around people that you don't know how they play the game, tips, ideas, um, just their outlook on the game. He says it's a great way to learn a lot of other people's points of view about the game uh, in a quick, quick and fun setting. And now he says he wants to tell you about his, his contribution this time is a new character class or subclass called the Samurai. 
as he mentions, he's not the first one to put this out there. Several people have, but then he's got his own class here he wants to share with people. It's very well thought out. It's very well done. Um, it's probably overpowered. It advances on an XP table like a magic user. So he says, and contentionally, it's a lot harder to level up here than it would be for, uh, for a fighter. Um, limitations on armor. Obviously, like most samurai, they have particular swords you know, that, that mean a lot to them. If they lose their main sword, they've got a quest to get it back, etc. Uh, the, the unique thing that he has here, in addition to these um, weapons, like the Shrieken and the, the two swords, are these samurai abilities. And for each level, he's got four, five, six different abilities. And you can pick one. He says sort of like magic user spells, right? As you go up a level, you can learn a new skill. Anything from being plus one uh, damage with your sword, the next, if you can learn that second level version of that and third level, then you know, adds pluses. Protection from different types of events like sleep spells, better use of a bow, horsemanship, uh, awareness, um, all kinds of different abilities. I guess I'm not going to go into all that detail here because he's got like three pages of these you know, different levels. They go up to level six uh, where he can learn decapitation and the death frenzy. Uh, but they're, they're, they're really well done. Makes it a really fun character class to play. I, I do wonder whether those bonuses make it overpowered. He, you know, he he he's thought about it, and he says, you know, you get all these extra sort of special abilities, but you're very limited, right? And so you you can only use that your your personal sword, um, and so you've got some limitations, just generally about the armor you can wear and the weapons you can use that maybe will counterbalance those extras special abilities. I think if you had this option in your campaign, um, somebody would probably have a lot of fun trying to, wanting to play it. Uh, and then he has a little philosophical article at, at the end here, or, or comment here at the end, about the two types of players that seem to be developing. Obviously says it's a generalization, but he says you've got the weapons player and the character player. And the weapons player loves to basically hack and slash, wants magic items because he wants to be able to, to do a better job at hack and slash. And then you get the character player who wants to make his little piece of paper come alive. Doesn't really care so much about combat. It's all about, you know, investing in the role playing of that particular um, character that you've rolled up, and that's where you get your enjoyment. And, you know, I think there's some definitely some truth to that. If you watch my videos before, you know I think there's no such thing as too many monsters. So here are things that go bump in the night. The fluff spider, Paul Blackwell's contribution. Little tiny fluffy spiders that like to drop down from above and crawl inside of your armor or clothing. They essentially uh, tickle you and making you minus two to hit, lowering your armor class by one, causing spellcasters to have a chance of spell failure until you strip down, um, find them, and squash them dead. That's essentially it. You know, nuisance monsters, it's, a cure, it's, a, it's an interesting change of pace, right? So, um, Cruel DM will obviously have some wandering monsters come along right about the time the party decides to strip down, but such is life uh, in the dungeon. Another contribution from Paul Blackwell is the Urt. The Urt is an unpleasant looking creature, like a rat that's green, has the scrawny tail and the beaky little nose. And essentially, um, if you come at him from the front, you have a minus two to hit because of the stench of his bad breath. If you come upon him from the rear, uh, you have to make a saving throw or become ill, i.e. nauseous, from apparently the odor that comes out the other end. That's it. Um, then we have the metronome from Dave Flynn. This one's Gonzo. Metronome is in, you know, TikTok. Um, but he's a gnome who wanders the dungeon and likes to go click clock click clock and drive you crazy um i'm not into the sort of gonzo silly monsters you know the fluff spider is about as far as i like to go in my campaign but lots of people like these silly things and so there is your metro gnome um the rosslk r-a-s-l-k from steve barber it's like a giant wood louse two meters long with all these little legs and eyes 
and it has essentially a, a whip-like appendage up on top of its head that it uses to, to uh, sort of strike you. Uh, and it carries an electric shock. It does D3 per hit dice, and these are six to 10 hit dice creatures. So it can do quite a bit of um, electrical shock damage. I think it's, that's a decent, clever, you know, rather unusual thing. And then Paul Blackwell rounds us out with one more. Again, green creature. This is the spike-tailed tree urt, U-R-T. Lives in trees. It's green, so it blends in. 80% chance it gets surprised on its first attack. When its tail, if you can see the photo, or the drawing, I mean, is basically like a spiked mace. And so it'll crack you with this mace as you come by underneath. Uh, and then it's just a one plus one hit dice uh, monster. So that's it for those. And then finally, our last fanzine that's in this APA style that's contributed here is Grillox, uh, which comes to us from Simon Robbins. And his contribution is discussion about languages. And he's got his own system here, wisdom plus intelligence divided by 2d6 plus three, equals the number of languages spoken. And as he says, your first language is common, your second language is alignment. Um, but if you can know more than three, you know, you use this, you can get some bonuses if your character background makes you of upper class. Uh, and then he's got a, he, whoops, then he's got a chart you roll for the languages that you potentially could learn. So that's his contribution. And then there's this, there's this comment at the bottom that he makes, which I'm going to have to go back and look at. I mean, I fairly familiar with the rules, but never picked this little clever trick up. It says, according to the AD&D &D Player's Handbook, a spep speptum or ransur, if you hit armor class eight with this sort of long spear with the curved hooks on the end, you can disarm your opponent. As he says, that's a very powerful um, attack against armed opponents. They can be in great armor, right? But you can take away their weapon that's a huge advantage. So from now on, I think my character, my fighter characters are always going to carry one of these things um, in, as part of my bag of tricks, right? Uh, the other thing he mentions here is he's, he's not so sure we needed the new hardcover books, the AD&D books. He thought the other books were just fine. I feel like the systems, you know, in, in hindsight are sufficiently different that, that it, I, it makes sense to me. But as someone who was playing the game as it evolved, he wasn't sure new books were really needed. Okay, and then this last thing I wanted to share was just some commentary on fanzines. We're watching this channel, so we like fanzines. Here's what's going on in his world, he says. The White Dwarf, obviously Games Workshop, great magazine. If you're not familiar with it, you'll really enjoy it, I think. Troll Crusher, we've mentioned before. Illusionist Vision, we've done reviews of those videos, he says. He goes, I personally know that Illusionist Vision is coming out. I've seen the proofs. He's just got to find a printer. And, of course, we know he did. Unfortunately, 3 was the last one, I believe, that ever came out. The Beholder, um, Mike Stoner, we mentioned he was in Demon's Blood number 1. But before Demon's Blood 1 came out, Stoner had told him that The Beholder was coming out. And he mentions here that Beholder 1 and 2 have already come out. He says number 2 came out about a week before uh, Demon's Blood number two. So that gives us some sense since they weren't dated at the beginning, uh, the time period when those were coming out. Underworld Oracle, he says, I'll believe it when I see it. There's more to come. Um, news from Bree, he says, I assume is dead. And then there's one called Wilderness Review, which is supposed to be a quarterly fanzine. And I said, I don't know much about it. Hopefully I'll have found one and read a copy before the next, um, the next issue comes out. So that is it, my friends, for uh, fanzine Friday, Demon's Blood number two. Hope everybody enjoyed the video. Hope you're enjoying the series. Uh, and I hope you're subscribed to the channel. Please tell your friends to give us a look. Maybe they'll become subscribers as well. And until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.